I finally got my video to work. Hello. Hello. I'm Kelsey. I am 22. I have a vestibular disorder and I also am diagnosed with POTS. Here I am. I'm back. I'm going to be talking about derealization, depersonalization, and disassociation. My story with it, what it is, what disorders it affects. I just wanted to also say that I am not a medical provider, I am not a doctor, obviously, because I am no medical professional. This is just my own personal experience with derealization, depersonalization, and any kind of dissociation symptoms. It's also taken from friends of mine that suffer with their disorders and their conditions. Two and a half years ago, I first started developing my POT symptoms and my vestibular neuritis at the time. Um, I started to have disassociation feelings, I guess. It was just brief little episodes where I, you know, started to feel just weird. Say I was walking down the street. There's people, there's animals, there's familiar stores maybe familiar faces, but all of a sudden you feel like you're in a dream and nothing around you is real. Everything was just like a surreal feeling, almost like you're on really heavy drugs, I guess. That's the best way for me to kind of describe it, even though I've never been on hard drugs. You feel like your legs kind of are marshmallows or spongy feeling. Um, every time when my derealization or depersonalization happened, my legs felt like I was walking on a trampoline. Like this wavy, gross feeling all the time. Like a veil was over me, um, and the situation, this the place that I was in, whether it be a store, you know, outside, my own home, just felt like it wasn't real. Just kind of like, just like a really thin veil is over your face and you're just separated by this like membrane, I guess, and you're behind it and you're watching everything happen around you, but inside it's almost like you're clawing and screaming to get out, but you can't. Like, the, like a nightmare that you're just living over and over and over and over and you're hyper aware of it happening, you're aware that you know, this sh shit looks different, my world does not look the same, everything looks weird and uncomfortable, and it's just this giant weight of uncomfortability, and you can't escape it, and you're just stuck. And then you'll kind of snap back to almost being on this autopilot of the depersonalization again, and this disassociation, and then you snap back to the hyper-focused, and you're hyper-aware of everything happening, and you're not able to, I guess, control it. And I feel like that's why it was so hard for me. That's why I was suicidal, because of that symptom alone. The symptom that was that triggering for me was the disassociation. Um, just because I couldn't control it. That was like the one thing that I had absolutely no control over. Nothing that I did touched it. No medications, no you know, home remedies. I tried anything I could think of. I would have ate dog shit if I could have. I was so desperate to get rid of those symptoms. I tried like everything I could possibly think of. When I did Google depersonalization and derealization, it always said that it was like a symptom or categorized with some kind of mental health problem or mental illness. Um, like condition. Maybe I need to work on my anxiety and my depression, but I was homebound, kind of bedbound at times, um, agoraphobic. It was so embarrassing for me to talk about that, my goodness. I was so embarrassed to talk about my battles with agoraphobia because I was so afraid of disrupting anything that I had going on. Um, I was so afraid to, you know, mess with that or make it worse or even just triggering it. Like the thought of me just triggering derealization or depersonalization to make it worse was a, that alone was triggering for me and enough for me to be like, nope. I still don't know what causes it really. Nobody knows. And even my own neurologist a couple days ago when I saw them told me that 
you know, there's not really a whole lot of research that we can do on it just because if you did, it would be with cadavers. Depersonalization is defined as a feeling of observing oneself from outside one's body or having a sense that one's surroundings aren't real. An indicator of underlying diseases when feelings become excessive, all-consuming, and interfere with daily living. And this is from the Mayo Clinic. They now call it depersonalization and derealization disorder. So it is like a disorder now, which I was never diagnosed with anything like that. They just said it's a symptom of your condition. Well, is it a symptom of the anxiety and depression? Or is it a symptom of the vestibular piece? You know, like it's it's so confusing. So with the disorder, according to the Mayo Clinic, they describe the uh, brain fog. It's very disturbing and feels like you're living in a dream. Facts. Feelings of intense trauma, psychological abuse, or interferes with daily activities, and the main treatment for this disorder is talk therapy. I did talk therapy for two years straight. I loved my therapist. Loved her. I will say, disclaimer, go see a therapist. Maybe for some people, you know, talk therapy would be beneficial because maybe it's just suppressed feelings and emotion inside, like these internal traumas that you're just not able to voice and get out. So one of my psychiatrists described derealization and depersonalization as being your brain kind of retracting in itself and trying to protect yourself from the trauma that you're experiencing. So almost as in, like he said, like a PTSD. The symptoms as well are feelings that you're an outside observer of your thoughts, feelings, and your body parts. For example, as if you were floating in the air above yourself, which that's true. Feeling like a robot that you're not in control of your speech or movements. The sense that your body, legs, or arms appear distorted, enlarged, or shrunken, or that your head is wrapped in cotton. That's also true, but I feel like that third step also falls in line with the Alice in Wonderland syndrome. The Alice in Wonderland syndrome is just classically defined as feeling like things are either really large and you're small, or you're really large and everything around you is small. It's another common one of people with vestibular disorders, as they describe like spatial disorientation, where you feel like you're really small and things are big or you're really large and everything's really small. Fourth one is emotional or physical numbness of your senses or responses to the world around you, which I felt like that a lot. Say if somebody was talking to me like my brother and you could like wave a hand in front of my face and you're just kind of like, hello, are the lights on? I would just be so kind of like slow to responding or being like aware. I would joke that if I were to hit by a car, I probably wouldn't feel it because I felt so just like numb. So my gosh, it's the weirdest thing. I hate talking about it. The fifth one is that a sense that your memories lack emotion and they may or may not be your own memories. One really scary symptom for me too, when you're thinking back to your own memories, like things yesterday or a week ago or a month ago, like somebody came and picked out pieces of that memory. It's almost like a puzzle that's unfinished, that you're missing like two or 10 of the pieces and you can't finish your puzzle and put it together because you're missing a few pieces. And the pieces are gone, they're long gone. <laughs> Derealization is the same kind of thing, but it's mainly about feeling emotionally disconnected from people you care about as if you are separated by a glass wall. Another really common one is surroundings that appear distorted, blurry, colorless, two-dimensional, artificial, or a heightened awareness and clarity of your surroundings. Derealization is more like emotionally disconnected from things. The causes for it are not well understood. Some people more than others are more prone and more vulnerable to experiencing these symptoms. I just wanted to share all of that to help people understand what derealization, depersonalization, and disassociation are and help people, I guess, kind of just understand because it's freaking terrifying. Um, it's the worst experience that I've ever had. I'm very, very, very thankful that I was able to have it virtually gone. The thing that I think helped me the most in terms of treatment for it would have been 
keeping to a schedule. You have to be consistent with things so you don't even feel like you're alive. So consistency is key. I would journal my symptoms to see how they change throughout the year. I would start small walks, you know, going to the mailbox, going to, um, you know, down the sidewalk, and then I started taking my dog on longer walks. The more consistent I was, the better I started to feel. Then I started to reduce my triggers, like my migraine triggers for my vestibular symptoms. That started helping a little bit. And the real kicker was when I started an antidepressant and mind you I tried like six different antidepressants until I found one that actually worked for me once I finally saw a psychiatrist that's when I started getting somewhere I don't really want to say what kind of medication I like which specific one I tried like brand name because it took me six to find the one that works for me. I'm more than happy to share with you the exact medications that I'm on, but I just don't want to throw it out there into the world because like I said, it took me so many to find the exact one that I wanted. One piece of advice that I was so, so grateful to hear from somebody is that it gets worse before it gets better. But I kept telling myself over and over and over when I was starting these medications to just stick it out, you know, because Every time I started a medication, I'd get the side effects that were listed on the paperwork or on Google or whatever, I'd get them. It was probably a lot of anxiety playing into it all too, like telling me that I'm getting these symptoms that I'm reading. It's no big mystery that, you know, migraine patients have a sensitive brain. Um, so I have to start on little baby doses and work my way up. It did get worse in terms of my symptoms heightening within that like four to six week mark for both my preventative and my antidepressant that it's just like a switch went on and I started to feel lighter. I started to feel happier. I felt more like I could smile and I could just breathe. The day that I started to feel like that, I was just like bawling. Like I was like touching the grass and I was like, the grass, the sky, you know, everything's just amazing. And I had like this lust for life again. I didn't want to live a life like that, you know, like it's, it's so hard to talk about and open up about and stuff, but I think it's so important to talk about it because what kind of quality of life is that, you know? Like if you're, I was just stuck in my apartment all day long, I wasn't working, I wasn't able to go to school. It's just so hard when you feel like nobody can understand you and understand what you're going through. But I just wanna tell you that I understand you, you do matter, and I care. Life is worth living. I don't have life figured out by all means. Life is worth living. You do get a second chance at taking the step if you want it, you know? And I think that's a very big thing, is if you want to make things happen, you will make it happen. For all the people that say, you know, it could be worse, so on and so forth, that's a bunch of bullshit, and I feel like that's a complete ableist mentality to say that there's worse people off than you are. Everybody's experiences are so unique, and I think that's a very ableist thing to say, to just get up and get stuff done and, you know, whatever, screw it, just change your mindset. I believe that it's all these small steps that you take to get you to this goal. It's more about aligning yourself with you and what triggers you and what makes you you and just work on those small things or maybe if you're the kind of person that needs to hustle and get stuff done like that and have this big wake-up call then let this be a wake-up call you know to get stuff done and get things moving but if you're not like me then it's okay and we're all at our own pace healing is not linear i just wanted to thank everyone so much for you know watching my videos and supporting me and just even listening to me is so so awesome like it's so cool that now I can being in the shoes of people that are watching and stuff I am so thankful for everybody and you know definitely just understand that you are not alone in this feel free to send me a message but just please know that you are not alone you do matter I care about you and you are loved thank you so much and I hope you have a wonderful wonderful day thank you